This is Rob Johnson, President of the Institute for New Economic Thinking. I'm here today with Bob Pollan from the University of Massachusetts at Amherst and the co-founder and co-director of the Political Economy Research Institute, PERI. We're here to talk about anything he wants to talk about, but particularly his brilliant work related to climate in his recent co-authored book with Noam Chomsky and how this new administration in this world is going to embrace the challenges that they frame in their writing. Bob, thanks for joining me today. Great being on. Thank you, Rob. So right now, we're in this turmoil. The notion in March of last year was that the pandemic was a surprise, a transient surprise. It seems to be much more resilient. We've gone through a presidential election. We have a new administration and this ominous specter of climate change and, how would I say, the displacement of just about everything, including life on Earth, stands out on the horizon. What do you see? What gives you heartburn? What are you cheering for? What do you wish you were seeing in this, okay, well, in this that's, context? That's a lot. But um, so, right, uh, since the pandemic, hit basically in mid-March, you know, we can look at the standard statistics on employment that I find like more illuminating. Just look at the number of people that have applied for unemployment insurance. Mm -hmm. Since March to now, I just actually calculated it last night, it's 47% of the labor force. Yeah. We in sometime between now and, uh, I mean, last March and now, roughly half of the people that work in the United States have applied, have gone, have become unemployed. So in terms of the severity of the downturn, it's equivalent to the, or not more so than the 1930s. We've got to get out of it. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. sure, we will, when, when people get inoculated, hopefully we'll be able to reopen. Uh, but we do need the, the booster because uh, people have been left behind. Businesses have failed. Uh, state and local governments are broke. And so, uh, you know, the, the, in um, March, we passed the, the first stimulus program that was 10% of GDP, the CARES program. Mm -hmm. We need more. Uh, the, uh, you know, in December, they passed the uh, COVID-19. That was $900 billion, about 4% of GDP. And now Biden is talking about another 1.9% of GDP, about 9%. All of that is needed um, in order to just lift the economy back off. Otherwise, we're, we're going to be stuck uh, in a very, very slow, halting recovery. Mm -hmm. So that's that's in the short term. Uh, over, you know, in terms of a sustainable growth path to return to, obviously, we have to deal with climate change uh, in a dramatic way that has not happened. Uh, the proposal that Biden had when he was a candidate, Build Back Better, was reasonably good. There were things about it that I thought were okay. The number one thing that I thought was okay was the scale of spending. He's proposing $2 trillion over four years is more or less in line with what I think uh, is a reasonable number. Uh, the other parts that I thought were okay was that he does give attention to the quality of job creation, not only numbers of jobs, but quality of jobs. And he does talk about the transition for workers and communities in the fossil mm -hmm. fuel dependent areas. Mm -hmm. So those are all good things. There are things I don't like about it, but those are the basic. And, you know, these are things that I think have to pass in the next few weeks. Uh, because after that, you know, then you, you lose your political momentum. Mm -hmm. I had a remarkable experience in the January uh, of 2019, where a bunch of people came to the Swedish consulate from Sweden, and they said, Mr. Johnson, you have to, at INET, recognize that the growth model of Europe is now the growth model, the American growth model's failing. So I continued to listen. And they said, in the old days, they said, deregulate everything, make the supply side flexible, you can reallocate resources to be more efficient, and you're off to the races. 
And they said, now with Donald Trump as president and all this anxiety and the displacement coming from automation and machine learning and globalization, the American people are terrified. And out of their despondency, they're becoming politically resistant to anything. Right. And we need to grow and we need to transform our energy systems. And the whole world depends on the United States. And while the European model used to be called sclerotic, we in Sweden, this was their quote, we don't protect jobs, we protect people. We transform pensions, they stay with you. We keep you and your children in school. You have your health care. Everything works provided you'll play along with relearning to be productive in, a, in the next or another sector. Yeah. And that's the new growth model. If you don't protect people, people will resist change. And when I read your work on climate, a substantial portion of the uh, mystery of why we're not evolving has had to do with that human resistance particularly within a country where people are terrified because they won't get adjustment assistance unless yeah, things yeah. change. No, no, I mean, I've actually, I've been doing this work uh, for uh, different uh, groups in Appalachia. I'm just mm. actually finishing uh, this project now. And that, you know, the number one issue is you've got to tell us the story that's real. And if you talk about something equivalent to trade adjustment assistance or other transition programs, they, they call it burial insurance. They said, yes. you know, we've been mistreated. We don't believe you. It's not going to be anything good. And so a lot of the research that I've been doing, in fact, we're putting out this one for West Virginia uh, next week, is to say, look, here's what it really takes. Um, the number of jobs that are going to be created through transitioning to the green economy are far outstrip the job losses that you will experience annually in West Virginia. But number one, we do have to do the investments in West Virginia in the green economy. Mm -hmm. And number two, we've got to be able to move the people and communities um, in a reasonable way. So the transition, it can't be, you know, just hand out, uh, here's $10,000 and, you know, go join this training program. Uh, we have to do these things. We have to guarantee their pension. Uh, we have to guarantee that they get another job. We have to guarantee that the pay at the new job is at least as good as the old job. And yeah, retraining as necessary, relocating as necessary. Mm -hmm. And you have to, it has to be real. So a lot yes. of what we've done is budget out these things. So even, mm -hmm. even for West Virginia, you know, where you have a high proportion of fossil fuel workers, mm -hmm. Even for West Virginia to do all of those things, you know, the overall budget to give everybody another job at good pay, relocate if need be, retrain if need be, it's like one tenth of one percent of the state's GDP. Mm -hmm. It's it's peanut, yeah. but you have to do it. That's you right. You have to be serious about it because I, you know, I give these talks and I hear this. Oh, fine, professor. That all looks good on paper. And you know what? You're going to keep your job. Uh, when the coal mines shut down, you still have your job. You're fine. But we're not because everything you're saying isn't going to happen. It would be great if it did happen, but it's not going to because the environmentalists and left people, they don't care about us. They hate us. And I try to fight against that. So that's kind of the dynamic. And it's true that Let's say let's say you don't even give a damn about these, you know, people in Appalachia, people committed to their communities in the in the coal regions or, or fracking. But let's say we really want to push a, a, a climate stabilization project. We we will not succeed politically unless we get these people That's on right. board. That's right. Yeah. Well, you're doing you're singing the music to my ears. I'm a boy that grew up in Detroit. And I watched yep. the country after the Voting Rights Act and the Civil Rights Act divorce the community where I lived. America divorced Detroit and they blamed the victims and there was no adjustment assistance. And you know, you were talking about all the different dimensions, but 
Even what I will call the non-traded local goods, things like movie theaters and restaurants, they're not part of that change in the auto industry when the Japanese skills came to the blossom and the dollar was overvalued and all of that other stuff. But those people who have skills need to redeploy their restaurant to follow the migration of people. And that's another dimension of uh, what yeah. happened. Detroit just collapsed, as everybody now knows. Detroit is a very good, what I'll call, canary in the coal mine example for what not to do in transformation if you want to have a coherent society. And the cynicism there reminds me when I was a freshman at MIT. I walked into my first... Uh, economics class and they started talking about equilibrium and I wasn't trying to be a smart ass. I raised my hand and said, are you just assuming a happy ending? <laughs> and the <laughs> professor looked at me. So I was on the side of your West Virginians in that particular moment. Well, look, not... I mean, they, you know, uh, even the people that hired me, uh, you know, West Virginia budget, uh, whatever it's called, budget policy, Ohio Valley, Mm. Uh, research. There's three, three, four groups, and I just sent them the study last week. And even you know this one guy in particular, he said, "Well, I'm a hillbilly from West Virginia, and you know, no, nobody's going to go for this because what you have to prove is, if we were to build up coal, it's still going to be fewer jobs." And I said, "Well, that is not really the issue. We've got to contract coal, but we have to have." The transition has to be real. It has to be robust. It has to be respectful. And I said, you know, it, it, in Germany is doing it. it has been mm -hmm. for decades. Mm -hmm. In the Ruhr Valley of Germany yeah. is, is a beautiful uh, example of, of a good transition. And they are right there in the Ruhr Valley. They are building out these really innovative things like using the open coal pit and running running hydro plants, running water down the pit when there's an excess supply, they run the water back up um, and they're generating uh, electricity. And then they have batteries, gigantic batteries right there in the pit. And the batteries then charge something like 400,000 homes. So, the, you know, why can't we just copy these things? And, but it has to be real. It can't, it can't be, mm -hmm. okay, we say it, a couple of professors, we have a conference, and then nothing happened. That's what that's what they think, and and they have very good reason to think that's what is a, a likely outcome. So we've got to fight to make this real. And luckily, you know, there are a lot of the groups have realized this. Uh, and in fact, I was just on a call with the so-called Green New Deal Coalition on exactly this point. Even the people on the left think the government is captured by money politics and won't serve them because it's not designed to serve them. No, well, so, that's true. Uh, you know, uh, so but, there's. Yeah. But we got a we got an exciting thing going on right now, which is even those powerful people have to breathe. Yes. Twenty years from now, and their children and their grandchildren. So we do well, have a, think, a common you know, purpose. Uh, certainly, uh, Biden was not my top candidate for the Democrats. In fact, he may have been my last candidate, but there are some positive signs. I mm -hmm. mean, I just, I have to say, I'm moved by just reading this morning, the Treasury Secretary Yellen just mm -hmm. saying, we need a big stimulus because people are hurt, are hurting. Right. I mean, when was the last time we had a Treasury Secretary say such a thing? That's right. Um, and she's insisting. And she's saying, sure, there's inflation fears, but they are far outstripped by the fears of what of people's lives getting ruined, having been mm -hmm. uh, decimated. Yeah, fifty percent, roughly, of the of the labor force has applied for unemployment insurance. Uh, and you know, in, in California, I was just looking at sixty yeah. percent. So um, you know, we've got to build the foundation, rebuild it, the stimulus program that Biden has is pretty good. And then we have to do the, the clean energy um, transformation. And, it's, uh, you know, it's, again, I think he's, it's, it's pretty good. And to, actually budget wise, his, his uh, allocation is higher than what they're talking about in Europe. Uh, Europe, they, they have all the, the lingo and 
but I've looked at it, and at least what they're talking about is, you know, like a half a percent of GDP a mm -hmm. year, at least so far, which won't get you very far. And well, you have a lot of interregional tension within the EU, which is a sort of partially developed structure that inhibits yeah. uh, what I'll call a unified and trusting thrust yeah. from emerging. Yeah. And, so uh, at least Biden is, you know, more like two and a half, two percent of GDP, which is around the range where I think that we can make some real progress. Mm -hmm. Well, you in some of your past writings, you have and recent writings. You've identified sources of resistance, and I remember a wonderful piece you wrote in The Nation several years ago, made three, I mean, we might call three principal nodes of resistance. One, which we might call the plutocracy of concentrated ownership in the fossil fuel business, and that they will play the games of political economy, money and super PACs and all that stuff to preserve their assets that probably have nothing like the value that they would have had yesterday or, or in a steady state. The second, I recall, was a fear of the communities where it's concentrated workers in the fossil fuel industry, like West Virginia, and yeah. the transition that you've talked about. And then there was a third, which was the equivalent of, I remember being in school in the OPEC years, where there was the equivalent of a supply shock as you take down the fossil fuel supply, not because it's displaced competitively because we can't afford to burn at that rate, right. you might induce a slump with a supply shock and we have to react to that. Yeah. I, I know you've had a very, very beautiful responses to each of these three, but why don't we, for the listeners, talk about particularly that third one. How do you, how do you deal with that supply shock? I mean, do you bring on the renewables faster? Yeah. Which creates jobs in the transition? What, how, yeah. What's the yeah. recipe for so, breaking this log jam? So, um, you know, if we follow the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, which is mm -hmm. the most authoritative organization, at least disseminating the scientific research, they said that we have to reduce emissions by 45% as of 2030 and be at zero by 2050. So if, if we do that, I think it's totally realistic to um, invest. What, we're not shutting down the fossil fuels to zero tomorrow. We're gonna shut it down over 30 years. And mm -hmm. uh, with a big, big you know, half of it, let's say roughly in 10 years. But even that, you know, the cheapest way to replace fossil fuel energy is through energy efficiency investment. Mm -hmm. And it's the easiest. It's very low tech. I mean, 40 percent of our all energy consumption is buildings. And just to make buildings more efficient is not that hard. Mm -hmm. um, you can get to 30 to 40 percent increased efficiency pretty cheaply, according to the engineering literature. So start with that, you know, and then also the building out solar and wind, especially solar. I mean, solar's come down in cost 80% yep. in, in eight yep. years. And this is even, I've been tracking even the energy department, the U.S. energy department under Trump has d documented <laughs> this. Even the, they, you're not allowed to write, you weren't allowed to write a memo under Trump in the energy department that mentions the word climate change. But they themselves put out these comparative statistics showing that uh, solar is cheaper than coal now and che way cheaper than nuclear now. So we can be building it up uh, incrementally and, and increasing efficiency such that we can hit a 50% reduction in nine years. I mean, I've modeled it. I'm not the only one. Mm -hmm. uh, my models are, you know, different than, for example, this work of these two guys. I've, I've worked with this group, Zero Emissions ZCAP Action Plan with Jeff Sachs, uh, mm -hmm. who's the leader of that. And mm -hmm. they have these two energy modelers, uh, Jim Williams and Ryan Jones, and for the first time, I worked with their model. They asked me just to estimate the job impact of their model. So their model is different than mine. There are specialists in different ways. But the result actually was pretty close to mine. So that was affirming. 
Can we hit a 50% reduction in, in nine years? Yes. It, will it be you know exorbitantly expensive? No, but it is two to three percent of GDP. It's not you know 32 percent of GDP. So it can be done. Uh, technically, the, the technology is there. The money needs to go there, and but then there's the politics. So then, sure, there's the resistance of the fossil fuel plutocrats, as you said, and then there's the resistance of the workers and communities that are dependent. We mm -hmm. have to address both. Mm -hmm. Well, I think the, uh, the it's a very interesting thing to hear you talk so enthusiastically about greater efficiency and renewables. Because many of the people, even left economists, have said we have to go to what they used to call degrowth. In other words, we're not going to change the microstructure of use and production of energy in relation to carbon burning fast enough. So we got to just go into a permanent slump. Well, I would stay in the state of despair in our political economy. That's tantamount to an authoritarian catalyst to an authoritarian government. It's a disaster. And, I mean, I've written about it. I've been in a debate with these people for years. I like them. They're, they, they mean well. They're well-meaning, well yeah. I know they mean well. Uh, I, I wrote a piece in New Left Review a couple of years ago that had like hundreds of responses, including calling me a racist and an imperialist and on and on. Um, but basically, the simple logic just doesn't work. Um, the only economist that I know of that actually modeled degrowth in a, in a sympathetic way is Peter Victor at University of York, and he's a good economist. And he shows, he does it, he's Canadian, he shows it for Canada. And he says, okay, here's how we can get emissions down by, I think it was, you know, 80% in 30 years in, in Canada. And then if you actually go inside the model, yeah, you can get there, but then GDP also goes down by 80%. Mm -hmm. I don't think so. <laughs> I don't think we're going to get anybody supporting 80% GDP contraction. On top of that, I mean, if you don't change the energy system, but you just degrow, what happens? I mean, it, the, the math is like sixth grade math. Um, if you keep the same energy system and you contract the economy by 10%, you contract emissions by 10%. It's proportional. So we don't even get degrowth, you know, 10% GDP contraction is a, yeah. is a depression. Mm -hmm. And we don't even get close to a zero emissions economy. So the only way is to uh, transition the system through renewables and efficiency. And I just want to say in defense of, you know, there's a lot, a lot of these people get into the rhetoric, but this guy, Peter Victor, and the other leading economist in this is named Tim Jack. Yep. They had a piece, for example, in Science a year ago. And if you get past the rhetoric, they're basically saying the same thing that I'm saying. Okay, there's minor differences, but they're really, really not saying degrowth delivers, uh, you know, climate stabilization. They're mm -hmm. really saying we need something akin to this green investment project. It's unfortunate that other people get all caught up in this rhetoric and they think that saying you're for degrowth means you don't, you're don't against capitalism. If you're saying you're for a, a green transition with the energy system growing, that means you're you know a capitalist. And it's just kind of silly stuff, frankly. Mm. Well, there's also a lot of discussion about how to finance the Green New Deal. Uh, yeah. we, we have a lot of debates related to the notion of MMT, modern monetary theory, and so forth. Yeah. And uh, I laugh because I remember MMT kind of emanating in Republican supply side discussions during the Reagan years when I worked on the Senate Budget Committee and I, the guru was Warren Mosler. So uh, oh, really? this, it, oh, it yeah, wasn't that's... really it wasn't really a far left notion at that time. It was the supply side growth can be financed without inflation and it was yeah. a mmt like precursor but yeah. but that aside uh we see a lot of people resistant to that kind of uh funding and people often use the fear of inflation when they're using the kind of yin and yang of central bank policy but i've often asked friends i kind of try to 
stand them up a little bit and I say, okay, so we can have 2% inflation and die or 4% inflation and transform the energy system so we go on living. What, why yeah. is it better to die <laughs> and keep the inflation yeah. rate lower? It's just, yeah. I, I don't understand how we're formulating our trade-offs. And I think it's in part the mindset of in a society where almost everything is modeled as a private good, where the scope and scale of this challenge is a public good of enormous proportion and, and implication. And we just got to shift gears. But how do you see it? How do you see what central banks ought to be studying, doing well, that's to, great, to play a role? That's a great question. So, um, yeah, I've also had debates with the MMT. I mean, uh, there's there's uh, certainly positive features to MMT, mm -hmm. um, but I, I actually don't think they're very original and but I mean, it's it's debt monetization. Can can the central bank buy up government bonds and retire them? Of course, it's always it's a the central bank does it all the time. The question is, can every central bank do it? Under what conditions and to what extent? So in the you know I've uh, the financing like in the book with Noam Chomsky, I talk about a global financing. Right. And, I, and about what I, I don't forget exactly, but I propose something on the a third of the overall financing should be essentially um, the, the Fed and the European Central Bank buying green bonds all over the world, not just in the U.S. and Europe, but everywhere. So mm -hmm. that, you know, that's the MM, you know, well, I don't want to call it the MMT. That's the debt monetization part. But the other things that I suggest, you know, simple things like cutting military spending, you know, cutting military spending by even 5%, that'll get you 15% of the way that you need for financing a global Green New Deal. Um, another is, is you, we talked before on about Jim Boyce and the, a carbon tax with redistribution. So if you introduce a carbon tax and then you, you know, I calculated in the book with Chomsky, I said, redistribute 75% of the revenue back to people, equal shares. And I think I calculated every person on earth gets an equal share. Everybody gets $60. Well, you know, in the US, $60 doesn't mean too much, but in Kenya, uh, you know, a four person family getting $240, that's gonna be, you know, uh, I don't know, 10, 15% of their income. So. It uh, that 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 will be another source, and you still have 25 percent of the money that can go into investing in the green economy. And then the fourth thing is to eliminate fossil fuel subsidies. So uh, fossil fuel subsidies are massive. The thing, though, is most of it is a, a form of um, egalitarian redistribution because it just makes it cheaper for people to buy fossil fuel energy. Yeah. So instead. You use that to re build up the clean energy economy and subsidize that. That basically, those four things pay for the whole project. Yeah. Now there are, there's of course a lot of refinements, but that that's basically it. It's really analytically, it's really not very hard. And sure, we can do we should do debt monetization. I don't think we should do it a hundred percent, but um, make a contribution. It, yeah. 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 Well, I think, you know, it's it's very interesting because when I talk to friends of mine from the Wall Street days who are prudent deficit hawk types, you know, they don't mind their bailouts in 2009 and presently. Yeah. But, but uh, you know, as they say, we're protecting assets, not people. But they, some of them maintain a faith in the kind of trickle down idea that if you maintain the value of assets, then the economy won't go over the cliff. But there's also a lot of inefficiencies. And I keep trying to tell my friends who are the deficit hawks, you should be taking on the extraordinary difference between the profitability of the pharmaceutical industry in this country and in other countries and the role of the public sector and the costs to Medicaid and Medicare associated with that. Daniel Ellsberg talks very vividly in his most recent book, the doomsday machine I about the need to bring down significantly the stocks of nuclear weapons and not modernize them 
and devote some of that savings to finance climate change. Then we That's then we live less dangerously and safer and longer. Well, so first of all, the you know I the Ellsberg book. I love that book, and you know subsequent to my reading it, uh, Dan is now a fellow at, at Perry. He told uh, me that. Yeah. Yeah. And actually, it was okay. I probably I might have thought of it myself, but actually, it was in discussions with him and his wife, Patricia, that they said, "Why don't Why don't you just finance this through cutting nuclear spending?" Nu you know. Yes. And so yes. I put it. I actually calculated it. Yes. So in the in the book with Noam, I, I forget exactly how much I said that the cutting military spending would be. I don't know, fifteen percent of the total. But I said we can either cut across the board, just all forms of nuclear spending, or just cut, you know, 75 percent of of uh, the nuclear projects. Mm -hmm. uh, and you can leave everything else alone, even though I don't agree with that. But uh, sure, there's no, yeah. you know, it's a thought experiment. Yeah, it's yeah. good. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, no, I think that Ellsberg and Dan and Patricia both are, are totally on the right track. And there's massive amount, any deficit hawk should, in principle, favor getting rid of wasteful spending, um, yeah, on the military. And as you said, also on on uh, medical care. So we have, you know, we have this medical health care system that we spend 18% of GDP, which is double the adva other advanced economy. Yeah, and because we rank some... 38th in the World Health Organization's That's exactly rankings 38. of the quality of the healthcare That's experience. Right. Exactly 38. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> yeah. So uh, now that's a that's a troubling situation, and I want to say to Elksberg's uh, credit, there is a benefit in addition to the budget savings, which is if the nuclear stocks come way down, the probability or even the possibility of what they call the nuclear winner, which you can read about in Nature and Science magazine, goes to zero. And that's a, a hypothesis or a scenario, you might say. It's not really a hypothesis. It's a scenario where if the nuclear scale is so high that and there's a conflict, about, I think he said something in the neighborhood of 800 million people would die from the explosions. But the fires burning the upper right. atmosphere and turning us into an ice age would take right. six and a half billion of the seven billion people to their grave yes. within a year's yes. time. And so yeah. he's talking about safety as well as savings to contribute no, to another form of safety. That's an amazing no, piece of course. public policy that uh, no. if we're going to build back better, we better get on our no, course for yeah, that no, one. And I, I think that, well, yeah, if we have to promote a book here, I, his book is just magnificent. Well, let's, uh, coming back to the climate issues, sure. and we, you know, we've been talking about budget, we've been talking about financing, we're talking about the technology of change, the adjustment assistance, but there's another looming challenge here. We have watched a disintegration of trust, the despair that's come to the surface in many countries with Brexit, our uh, what I'll call the otherness of America, the nationalism. We've got to go back to the idea that we're all in this together. To use a simple example, India is a very large place. In per capita burning of energy, BTUs per person, they burn about one-tenth of what the Americans do. So they can look at us and say, we're poorer than you. We need to grow. You guys need to cut back. Right. But we can't really play a kind of musical chairs game or yeah. the clock will run out and we'll all suffer. How do we get to the place to coordinate yeah. global reduction? Because your book, or I think is your book or one of your articles enunciated that the U.S. and China are the biggest, but together they're 42%. And if you throw That's in right. Europe, you're at about 52%. Yeah, the so other 48 matters a lot. Yeah. And there needs to be global adjustment assistance, global transformation assistance, and coordination on a timetable that's very urgent. Yeah. How are we going to pull that together? Yeah. So, I mean, I've, I've done work in India um, and other developing countries. And I had this project with um, United Nations Industrial Development Corporation on transition in developing countries. And I'm doing another one now with um, 
UNCTAD, United Nations Trade. Mm -hmm. So uh, really the one I'm doing with UNCTAD right now is exactly on how you finance in the developing economies of transition. Again, you know, the basics, of course, there's a lot of complicated stuff. The basics are really simple. And, you know, India can grow just fine um, with clean energy. They do the transition too. And uh, my coworkers here, Indian coworkers, wrote a brilliant paper on, let's assume as part of this thing, you know, instead of fossil fuel subsidies, we just give out solar energy for free. And, you know, in the rural areas of India, there is there's basically half the people have no electricity whatsoever. So if you start putting up small scale solar uh, operations, this is going to be transformative for their lives and just making their lives better. Mm -hmm. uh, and you've got clean energy. And but, it, you know, it has to be subsidized uh, to make it not going to happen if it's not subsidized. So the, the rich countries, especially the U.S., we have, yes, we have to subsidize it. Part of it can be through buying these bonds. Uh, you know, we can think about different mechanisms, but it's basically India or Kenya, they float green bonds and the U.S. Treasury buys them or the U.S. gives them to the World Bank or, you know, whatever the details are. Mm -hmm. And it has to be at scale. It has to be, at, you know, 1% of global GDP. Uh, that's the part where, you know, debt monetization can, can work just fine. So it's not taking money out of anybody's pocket. It's just creating new uh, activities and, and new finances. So, yeah, that's I, that's a project I have right now with, with UNCAD. And of course, I'm not the only one. But mm -hmm. um, I don't think that the basics are, are that hard. It, you know, it's really, okay, working out details but really it's working out the policy. And the rich yeah. countries just have to acknowledge that yes, these the poor low income countries can grow. But as you just said, if they grow and they say, well, you know, we're not rich, you're rich, so we have to grow. But if we're saying that means growing on the basis of fossil fuels, it doesn't matter what happens in rich countries. Right. That will blow out the, you know, the carbon budget in seven years. If India, if you just take India, Indonesia, Mexico, uh, Brazil, if they grow on the basis of fossil fuels, it doesn't matter. We will never hit uh, the emission reduction target. I laugh at, I mentioned to you my Swedish meeting. After they finished talking about sclerosis in Europe and the United States bogging down because of the fears of large scale transformation related to technology and globalization, they started talking about perhaps the Chinese model has something really? to offer with more basic science. And Peter Goodman from the New York Times, who I believe is based in London, he wrote a story about this group from Sweden. Oh. And it said, uh, we love the robots, was the name of the, the headline of the story, meaning oh. robots improve the production possibility frontier. And as long as you're going to take care of me as a human, we can deploy them and climb the ladder. Yeah. And the Chinese seem to be, uh, whether it's coercive or whether it's uh, like in Sweden, a consensus that that dynamic posture makes sense. I don't know. But I think uh, the, the American model is being challenged now because we need to cooperate with each other and facilitate transformation and what I'll call anesthetize or diminish, eliminate the resistance to transformation. Well, yeah, that's that's obviously true. And yeah, so having a decent welfare state, uh, you know, I saw uh, in the FT the other day, Danny Roderick had an interview and he said, well, we, we got to think beyond the idea of a welfare state. But I mean, the, the basic idea of, of giving people social protection is whether you want to call it a welfare state or not, I don't care, but the point is, yeah, that people don't have to fear their livelihoods are going to get decimated, like you're talking yeah. about what happened in Detroit. Yeah. Uh, that has to be built into the foundation of a decent society. And when we talk about, you know, mainstream economics, you know, what they call uh, what is called labor market rigidities is that is a, is a source of unemployment because people are basically you know, given too much, so they don't really care about getting a job, so they're unemployed. But 
labor market, another way of, of using the term labor market rigidity is, is to saying social protection, foundations right. of a decent society. You know, right. you, you, because you're a human being, your basic things are being provided for you. And then, yes, beyond that, we need to build, you know, we need to innovate. We need to transform many things, including the energy system. And uh, but the foundation of a welfare state, of a, of a robust welfare state is critical. And I did work like 12 years ago in sub-Saharan Africa. And even there, I was arguing, you know, of course, it's at a different standard, but let's let's get let's go there and let's, let's see how we can construct that. There are all kinds of people who can do things with statistics and mathematics and they're fancy. But a great economist is someone who picks the right problems that matter. And you and your institute have always done that. Thank you. In That's a way that I watch closely as I try to understand what I should be doing with my team at INET. You really do, I think 80% of the challenge is asking the right questions. And you guys are really well, good at that. And your great. leadership is outstanding. I really appreciate you saying that. I teach a class actually called Applied Econometrics. I have for 20 years. And that's what, that's what I say on the first day. I said, I'm not really that good of an econometrician. I don't know. I don't know all the techniques. I know some of the techniques, but I can learn the techniques when I need them. But the yeah. key thing is to ask the right questions. 